I mean, you speak Norwegian, Jumana, because you've been I living do. here in Norway for yes. how long? About four years. Okay. But ke kept coming back every year for different periods of time. But it's too rusty to speak in Norwegian. But I'm happy to take questions in Norwegian afterwards. Yeah. So, uh, nice to see you again. You um, too. Yeah, last time we saw each other was in April, mm -hmm. I think, in, uh, in Israel where we were shooting your next project, which is now in, in production, uh, or maybe an ID phase. So I think um, I would like to start, uh, in a way, in the beginning, um, how you work. So I would like to know how you get started with a project. When will you get an ID? Because you work uh, both with sculptures, you work with film, uh, you work with collage and stuff like that. So how do you get started and how do you know if it's going to be a film or if it's going to be a collage or a sculpture? Um, yeah, let me think. I mean, the, the process has been different for different projects. Um, like I, like I told to you, I mean, um, sometimes one project leads to the next. So I start researching one theme and that leads to the, f the project after it. Uh, so I, I can't say that there is like one, one way of working, but... For the films, um, earlier I used to start from very personal starting points. So there was uh, something I felt I needed to do or kind of a certain fear I wanted to overcome or somebody I wanted to meet again. Um, and, I, and that would be the starting point. Um, and at the moment, some of the more recent projects have to do with more, let's say, field of research that I'm interested in. Um, but it always comes from a certain intuition or a certain attraction to a theme or a place or a person. Um, yeah, that I want to kind of get to know more about. Mm. Um, with the films, they're usually more kind of long-term projects and they involve a bit of research and production and raising money and all of that. So um, they're more, yeah, they're more production oriented. And in that sense, um, I would say they are kind of, it's a much more structural way of working. And I decide to research a certain theme and I start writing um, I go and shoot and then I start to edit and I realize what I'm missing so I shoot again. So it's kind of a longer term process. Um, while the sculptures, usually I get fixated on a certain image or a juxtaposition of images that I want to work on. And um, it takes me like a year or two before I'm able to really start working usually on, on this image. It kind of stays with me for a while. Like I say, okay, now I want to work with like cubic forms that relate to architecture and so. I start thinking of certain more specific themes that I'm interested on, but it takes a while for, for them to like process in my head before I want to start producing. But then the production process itself is quite fast. Um, Buba Scord is sitting here in the audience. We sometimes work together on sculptures and we like to work fast <laughs> and make a lot of stuff. So the sculpture process is usually, yeah, it's much more immediate because it's in the studio and it's with materials. And so there's kind of both the immediate pleasure um, but also not as much um, pressure of having to develop relationships with people and places, which is very important for me when I make the films. Um, but yeah, so that's a, that's a general overview, and then we can maybe go into more specifics with the different projects. Yeah. Um, <coughs> but I mean, when you work with film, uh, because we're going to talk mostly maybe about your film production. That's right. Yeah. Do you work uh, in a more um, uh, standard way of filmmaking that you make a script or is it more like an overview? You have some certain images, you have a theme and then you start shooting early. Mm -hmm. Or do you write the script when you know what's going to happen in this film? Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, uh, since I, had, I'm not, I don't have any film education and I started making films basically when I was here. Um, they were more videos and kind of video performances when I was at school and then I think I made the first short film right after I finished school here in Oslo. Um, and at the moment, like with these two last features that I've done, um, I haven't really approached it in a traditional film sense where you write a script, you get a producer, you raise money, you shoot, you edit and so on. Um, I mean, I've been fortunate to get support from lots of different institutions and art invitations. so. The, the kind of fundraising process ha happens throughout the duration of the making of the work. So often I, I just apply for, for grants or maybe I get an invitation. They say, okay, you have $5,000 or $10,000. And I start with that. Um, and, and I keep trying to raise money as the project goes along, I'm hoping that kind of more money will come in. 
or I kind of use money from works that I've sold or kind of previous projects and I put it in. So that's for the for the fundraising thing. That's usually kind of a very big deal for like, let's say more traditional filmmaking to, f to raise enough funds before you start working. It is because you also have to know what the film is going to be about and have a yeah. pretty a solid plan and in which order things are going to happen. So yeah. this way of fundraising the film actually goes into the process of making it in yeah, a very that's right. good way, I think. Yeah, so um, maybe to be more specific, like with Wild Relatives, um, I don't know how many here are familiar with the project, but basically it follows a transaction of seeds that happened between an institution that was based in Syria, in Aleppo, Syria, that had to move to Lebanon. And they, through over a very like long and laborious process, they decided to duplicate their entire seed bank. That's a kind of refrigerator filled with seed samples. Uh, and they did so by pulling out seeds from the Global Seed Vault, which is up in Svalbard, uh, and planting them in the Bekaa Valley. So I read about the story in the news. I mean, it was getting a lot of news attention. And I knew I wanted to work on it because I had been working on kind of the politics of archives for a while. And um, the, the kind of contradiction that I find with a lot of modernist projects and especially archival projects, that's like whenever there's an attempt to preserve and keep things safe, you're also erasing something in the process. Like something is being either frozen and in that way being kind of taken out of its natural settings and kind of the organic processes it's in, or it's just something else is being erased that's not being told in those archives. So I knew I wanted to work on that film, on this project, I mean, and um, I felt that what I was reading in the media was um, a use of this story to talk about Syria. So there was no real investment in what these institutions are and who are the people behind them and who are they actually affecting. Um, so I knew I wanted to respond to that. Like I wanted to do a film that was telling a different story than what was in the media, but I really didn't know what the film was going to be. And I remember we were talking a lot that it's difficult to kind of build a film where the protagonists are seeds. Like the, the, the only characters that we were following were seeds. Yeah. And in that sense, it took a while to build like a character a human body, <laughs> also like characters who we wanted to follow. Um, so with this film, it yeah, we, we just, the first time we went shooting, like we didn't really know what this film was going to be, aside from that we're gonna follow these seeds across one year. Um, and so, yeah, this film was, was a very kind of, like a step-by-step -step process in terms of, I had written just a project description and kind of with my intentions and orientation after of course doing a bit of research and field trips. Mm. Um, but the script came only after that. So after the first phase of shooting, I started compo composing a script and trying to think like who are the different characters in Lebanon and in Svalbard who are gonna kind of create a structure mm. for the film. Um, and the script kept evolving every time we shot. So we shot, I think, six times in total, four times in Lebanon, and twice in Svalbard. And um, yeah, the script was something that was constantly evolving. So I, th I think of the script more as like a, a skeleton or like a backbone for the project, but there's like, yeah, le leaving a lot of space for improvisation. Yeah, and I think also, um, maybe specifically for this project, also because you you didn't grow up in Lebanon, it's not your home, mm -hmm. uh, your home turf. And neither is Svalbard, which is a very sp sp particular place. So when you came to Svalbard and you started shooting there, suddenly this whole new uh, theme mm -hmm. arose, you know, about this, the mountains and the, and, and, uh, the mining going on there mm -hmm. and, and stuff like that. Yeah. And you had to take everything into consideration all the time if this is going to be a part of the film. And right. Yeah. Um, <coughs> but when you work like this, you have uh, you meet a lot of different people mm -hmm. uh, that come along uh, during the project. And I mean, even though you work with um, a documentary, I would say it, it's kind of a documentary mm -hmm. in, the, in the terms of it's not being any actors in your films. But you have a very uh, specific sense of who is going to be the protagonists yeah. or who, who, who is going to be the driving force of this film, yeah. who will be the main characters. Yeah. Yeah, so in, a, in that sense, like the, the casting process is very important. And um, I don't just go and shoot like whoever I meet that day. Like there is a, d it's very much about developing relationships. Um, so yeah, in the first shoot, not so much. Like I was saying, we really went exploring with the camera and like from the visual material we got, started thinking about like what, what can this film do? Like, yeah, what kind of structure, what kind of rhythm? Um, 
what kind of language is this film going to have? But once that script started falling a little bit in place, it, it was very much about thinking of like, I think of it as like mapping characters who create some kind of interesting landscape, like who create like relations both between each other, but also complete and contradict each other to, to be able to talk about the thesis somehow that I'm interested in. Mm. So in the film, we follow this institution, Icarda, that's called, called like duplicating their seeds. Um, but then th in the film, there's somebody else called Walid who also works on seed preservation, but is not an institution, isn't, ba isn't backed by um, big, big grants and big governments and so on. It's like a very grassroots project. And meeting Walid um, was very important because he became the critical voice towards the institution. So in a way, the casting of, of the characters is part of also writing the film and thinking like how the voices of these different people bring in different perspectives for the story that I want to tell and the, all the different contradictions involved um, in this process. Um, so for instance, and for the Svalbard part, I mean, I went there first the first time just to, to see what this place is. Um, and I spent just a couple of weeks kind of trying to get a feeling of what life is like on Longibian. Um, and I just wrote lots of emails to people like in the municipality in different offices, I just went for lunch and dinner and tried to talk to people. And I've and yeah, it's it's well known that it's a mining comp it's a mining town. It was, so it was established as a mining town, even though now the mines are shutting down and being replaced by kind of sp sp science and research, tourism and yeah. tourism. Yeah. Um, so the m the mines were very important for me. Like I felt it was it would be impossible to ignore ignore the mines and especially because the Global Seed Vault is situated inside a mountain that used to be mined for coal. Mm. So the, the coal mining kind of wasn't just something that we ran into, but it was also, um, again, this irony of preserving something because of climate change, you know, and many other reasons, but climate change being a, a core reason inside the very void, which was kind of extracted for coal and the burning of fossil fuels being the main reason for climate change. So this kind of, this like dark cycle of capitalist extraction production. And um, so, so yeah, in this kind of field trip, um, I got to know lots of different characters amongst them, the coal miners. And we did shoot an amazing scene with the coal miners that didn't make it into the film. Um, but they were gonna play, a, yeah, they were gonna be also protagonists in the film. Um, but that's also where I met the priest and scientist that have kind of a key scene yeah. in the film. Yes, and I thought maybe we could show a little clip from this scene. It's a scene shot up in Svalbard, um, in the in the valley, just uh, in the hills outside of uh, Longibien. And um, what was the name? It was Kjell. Uh, what was the name uh, of the uh, priest? Uh, uh, Leif Magne. Helgesen. Leif Magne, yeah. Uh, yeah. Leif Magne Hel Helgesen, and um, the scientist is Kim Holmen. Mm. Yeah. So this is a scene that we will have a look at. Yes, the stars of the film. That's the stars <laughs> of the film. So in a way, you could say that uh, Leif Magne and Kim, they are amateurs, but they are also people who are extremely uh, used to media. Yeah. Uh, he is head of the Polar... Uh, yeah, the Norwegian Polar Institute. Institute. Yeah, which is located up in Svalbard. And I mean... Svalbard is uh, politically interesting yeah. these days, uh, and I remember you told me you were there and you walked with Kim, uh, and suddenly you you met some guys in the street, <laughs> and you handshaked and stuff like that. And when they passed, he said, "Oh, that's the what was it? Uh, the Chinese foreign minister?" Or something. Yes, the yeah. Chinese foreign minister, <laughs> because they're also there sniffing around, <laughs> finding, yeah. seeing if they can establish something up there. Yeah. So uh, in a way, there are stars in this place. And Leif Magne also has been uh, on television a lot. And yeah. so they know what to say uh, in yeah. a way. Yeah. And they picked up quite good, I would say, in this film. Yeah. Their roles. Uh, yeah. yeah. I got to know actually Leif Magne on because I was doing research on Svalbard and Enarco had the program on Svalbard, like a documentary. Mm. And then there was Leif Magne. <laughs> 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 Who is this guy? <laughs> like, uh, he he like he's very performative. So like on the TV, he was like walking down the mountains of Svalbard with his with his robe and going like this <laughs> with his <laughs> with his arms out. So um, I wrote him an email when I, after seeing and saying that I really wanted to meet him because I just had a feeling like 
he would be a great character. Um, and he is. I mean, he's super interesting. He's like um, obviously a man of the church, but very open-minded and very committed to the community that he's living in mm. and very engaged politically. Um, he's also spent a lot of time in Palestine and published like books on Palestine. And um, So, I mean, like for him, through through the church, he works on a lot of also political and social issues. So... And yeah, he loves to perform. He's also a musician. He's he's a multi-talented guy. Yeah. Um, and if you remember, like we had planned scenes, two different scenes for these characters. There was a scene for Life Magna and a scene for Kim. Um, and then when I met there, met them up there a few days before we were supposed to shoot, we went out for dinner, the three of us together. Um, uh, and they said to me, like, "Hey, we're we're best friends, so why don't we just do this scene together?" Like. So it was actually their suggestion to kind of combine um, the two separate scenes and do something together. And uh, the dinner was really funny. Like I had a really good time with them and I just went home and I wrote down a lot of the things that we talked about in the dinner and a lot of the jokes that they were making. Mm -hmm. um, and I gave them the script the next morning and they both said, don't worry, we will take care of this. And they did. They really did. And they, <laughs> they did this on their own. They just kind yeah. of started and it was uh, yeah. very nice. Yeah, it sounds kind of written, but yeah. it isn't. I mean, not semi. Yeah, semi. But yeah, but they of course. definitely improvised. Like I, yeah. yeah, they started walking up onto that structure, and then they stopped mm. and said, "Hey, is this okay?" And we were like, "Yeah, keep going." But yeah, there was a lot of their kind of initiative in there. Yeah, that's very nice. I think uh, it's interesting to talk about this wild relatives because this is the film that we're going to show. Mm. Um, so there is another clip that kind of. Uh, sets uh, or s starts uh, some other interesting questions maybe to talk about, which is um, from uh, Bekaa Valley, mm -hmm. uh, when we were there for the third time, I think. Yep. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. um, when, because uh, maybe you would like to say, I mean, the people that we are filming, uh, we're going to a refugee camp mm -hmm. uh, because Ikarda are using people from the refugee camp to work in the fields. ICARDA is, it's, it stands for the um, Agriculture International, International Center, Center of Agricultural, Agricultural Research, Research in, in the Dry, dry areas. areas. Wow, yes. great, you got it. Yes, <laughs> I've been practicing. And so they do research both in laboratories and they also do research in the field. So they plant some seeds into the field uh, and also in the laboratories. And for the field work, they pick up people from the refugee camps because there's a lot of refugee camps uh, throughout the Bekaa Valley mm -hmm. from the Syrian um, civil war. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we follow this one day. We, we go there and we follow the people that are picked up from the refugee camp into the field. Mm -hmm. And uh, when we started there, w we didn't know exactly what was going to happen. And so it was more or less like we would just jump on and follow it. And what happened is what we got. So it's not staged in a way. So maybe we can just see this little clip. Yeah. Okay. <coughs> uh, I remember when we were shooting this mm -hmm. because the lorry was just filling up with uh, girls mm -hmm. and I just jumped in and we uh, it, it drove into the field and they stopped and they started walking out and lined up like this. Mm -hmm. And I remember afterwards, uh, we were like, okay, that was great. That was a great one. And then you said, yes, it's very that's, that's very good, but I'm really not looking forward to going to Norway and talk about this image because all the audience is going to talk about is gender mm -hmm. and a guy uh, pointing towards women and asking them where to stand and stuff like that. Yeah. And I just... I just remember that because uh, when we were down there, uh, this doesn't strike me at all. Mm -hmm. But I um, kind of recognize it as well. Mm -hmm. And I think it's interesting because a lot of your work is very political and talking about kind of complicated political issues. And how do you feel, how do you think it is to exhibit here in Norway and talk about your work? Yeah, yeah. so... Yeah, it's a com it's a complicated topic. Uh, I know, yeah. I know. So yeah, I mean, there is an obsession here, but I would say also across the kind of European and yeah Western world, 
with kind of girls with hijabs, you know? Like as soon as they see with a girl with hijab, it's like, oh no, we have to talk about this. Are they oppressed? Are they okay? Are they like, and that just like, there's just this fixation um, on, on gender being as if like the biggest problem in, um, in the Arab and Muslim world. Um, and often I just like feel like rolling my eyes when I'm in an audience and that's, that's the first, like somebody raises their, question, their hand and that's the first question that I get asked. What about the gender relationships in the film and can you talk about these girls? Um, so it's not to say that there is gender equality. We are absolutely far from it and Lebanon and the whole Middle East is full of sexism, but I would say so is Norway. So um, it's just kind of masked in a different way. Uh, and uh, obviously it's not, yeah, it's not as extreme in, in certain um, parts of the society. Um, and in that sense, I do feel, of course, that like uh, showing my work here or showing my work um, anywhere with, with audiences that are not particularly familiar with these contexts, there's a lot of explaining to do um, for them to get, for certain aspects of the film to come across. Um, and that's not my favorite part of the job, you know, like having to, to fill in, to fill in people about like kind of basic, like how is life in Palestine, you know, like, um, or, so these are questions that always come up and they're not the most interesting questions, but that's, I think, part of accepting that different audiences have different access and different, um, relationships to what's being shown. Um, and of course, when I see a film from a country that I know very little about, I will also be missing um, a compass or kind of missing certain um, familiarity with the images that I'm seeing. Mm. Um, but yeah, I mean, in Norway, of course, it's a little bit complicated because on the one hand, I feel very attached to this place and I feel like I, you know, this is a home of some kind. I'm very familiar here and I have a lot of strong connection with Norway, but, um, but I also don't live here because it's, um, it's you, you are always the other and you're always the other explaining yourself. Uh, and that's boring, you know, that's a boring position to be in and it's very limiting. So that's kind of the contradiction. And on the other hand, yeah, I, 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 I have felt a lot of love in Norway and have a lot of love for like at least the scene here and a lot of people. So um, it is a bit of a complicated relationship in that way. And every time I come back, I have that kind of conflicted like love and also frustration of the limitations. Um, um, but just to as a counterpoint, for example, like um, this scene with Life and Kim, like there's some audiences that really laugh a lot in the cinemas when this comes on, mm. and other audiences that don't. You know, like I think when I showed it in Palestine, there was a couple of chuckles in the audience, but people were like, okay, like they liked it, but it wasn't like the highlight of the film. So I think people just relate to things differently, and that's that's part of what's nice of just making film and letting it live. Um, and kind of accepting that the film is not kind of in your hands once it's shown. Like people will see different things and be interested in different things and, and trust in the film to, to kind of stand on its own. But I mean, uh, as a cinematographer of this film, uh, I was invited by you to come and work on this project and uh, it is a documentary and it wasn't really, it wasn't, you didn't know exactly what was going to happen all the time and so stuff came up. There's a lot of dialogue and I don't speak Arabic. I don't understand what's going on while I'm filming. Mm -hmm. And I don't understand the political history of the region. And um, I think that was kind of uh, interesting and I felt very trusted by you <laughs> to actually you know, make choices on the fly as you have to, uh, as a cinematographer in a documentary. And um, yeah, I think it's interesting to ask you how, uh, how you've, felt around this? How yeah. does it feel? I mean, to work with someone who made decision not based on anything of what the people were saying yeah. <laughs> on camera. Um, but you're very good at body language. So I think that's a lot of also what we followed. And that's kind of one of the reasons why I was excited to work with you is because, um, especially when I started, I didn't imagine this a film with a lot of talking. Because again, the protagonists were the seeds and seeds don't really talk. So it was very much about thinking about rhythms, kind of both like rhythms of from like cycles of nature, but also rhythms of work in the field and um, movement. Yeah, yeah, movement and, and textures and so on. Um, and that doesn't really need language. So I felt like mm -hmm. you had a really great intuition with that and, um, and it didn't really matter most of the time if you were understanding or not. With some interviews, of course, um, I would have wished you started your Arabic course, you know, before you came, but. 
I'll give you a few more years. <laughs> um, yeah, so there's certain, there's certain in th it, like, uh, situations where it is helpful to have the language. Um, but I think there is also a freedom in uh, you not understanding. Like, I, th I think particularly with the girls, like, they f maybe they feel more free because they can, you know, I've established some kind of relationship with them. But when you come, you don't intimidate them because, you know, they have no attachment to you. You can't really. So I think it's it can also be a point of freedom for some for some situations that you're you re you remain somewhat anonymous. You know, they will probably never meet you again, and they know that. And um, there's yeah, that you don't come also with any kind of social baggage or judgment, or you're just a foreigner. So <laughs> that's how it is. <laughs> um, but I, I mean, yeah, if you, I'd be curious if you want to say a little bit more yourself, like on this topic in comparison to working with documentaries, let's say in Norway or yeah. places that you're more familiar. Well, I mean, we had been talking about it in the beginning, like what kind of um, film language you were interested in exploring. Mm -hmm. I mean, you had just made this film, uh, a very nice film called A Magical Substance Flows Into Me which uh, we will see a uh, clip from a little bit later. And um, where you had been working very planned, you, were, you, you knew exactly which shots you wanted and you, you followed that, your kind of storyboard. Yeah. And now you wanted to release a little bit from that and be more loose, more handheld, more dynamic. And, um, and I think some of the things that you mentioned is like, you know, soil, hands, seeds, feet, mm -hmm. tactile stuff. And so this was my uh, reference, I, you know, when we were filming, and I didn't know exactly what was going on, and yeah. I, 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 I turned to this when I had to make decisions uh, where I didn't really know what they were talking about, mm -hmm. and I thought that was a kind of a, a great uh, yeah. frame to work out of. But did you feel out of place sometimes, or did you feel a bit like alienated by not really knowing what's going on? No, I never felt out of place okay. in this film. I think it was very. Uh, kind of obvious what we were filming mm -hmm. uh, and what to film. Yeah. And also, of course, we went away from this idea of being very handheld. Right. I mean, after the f like first day, we understood that this was more an idea, but it didn't really apply, mm -hmm. maybe, to the aesthetics of the place, because everything was fields and lines, yeah, and rigid. everything was very symmetrical and stuff like that. So to working handheld and moving around all the time, it was... Uh, hard and it was yeah. not really serving the the location very well yeah there was a lot of stillness and a lot of waiting and yeah. a lot of like institutional board like sitting at desks and so on that's true yeah yeah um <coughs> in terms of how you work i mean um coming back to this uh documentary uh word I think that um, this also, the, the previous film, A Magical Substance, that flows into me, but also the work that you did before. You started to work with cinematographers and you had editors. When you shot your own films, it's very visual. It's a very cinematic language. Um, you're talking to emotions, in a way. And uh, I'm wondering, I'm curious about your thoughts around the more poetic film language or the more um, cinematic film language in terms of communicating to the audience your political mm -hmm. ideas or reflections or questions? Do they open up in any way? Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah, I... Although it's true that I had a lot, like, particularly the last these last two films, but also some of the shorts that I've done are kind of around, like you said, kind of very specific and comp complex or multi-layered kind of political issues um, but it's usually not the politics that's the drive of the film not only I mean obviously there is a certain commitment to politics and unpacking certain ideologies that's very important for me and is an important drive um, but I'm I'm very committed to also the formal aspects of filmmaking and art art making I mean they come hand in hand for me. So um, I am interested in how film, for instance, as a medium has that capacity to uh, bring certain textures and um, visceral encounters with issues that transmit those politics or transmit those issues or those relationships. Um, and you don't always need the kind of uh, explanation to bring across the kind of feeling or again, set of contradictions or of violence even of some kind 
that's not vis visible maybe when you just look at an image, but you need to find a way to transmit it through movement, sound, rhythm, editing, and so on. Mm. So that's exactly the process that I'm interested in filmmaking, like how to find those combinations, both in the editing, but also in the image and sound, and how to create those images that transmit um, yeah, those relationships, or again, those kind of violences or absences that I want to talk about. Mm. Um, and in each film, it's a little bit different. I mean, in this case, like, yeah, it's true. We talked a lot about handheld, also because I had seen some work of yours, which was all handheld, um, and I really loved it. And it was so different than the film that I had done before that was very static. Mm. Um, and each, each shot was really like a distant shot, like a composition in a home, and the people would move, but the camera wouldn't move. And um, and in this case, the whole film is about movement between these two landscapes or these two geographies, and, th and so I thought it would make sense that things would be like handheld, and the, the perspective would be the perspective of a seed that's never like um, a wide shot of a camera, but it's something that's very subjective. And so I, yeah, I mean, I try, I try to think through what perspective I'm trying to bring through in the film, and through that also develop a certain camera language, but also kind of yeah, general language around the film. Um, with Magical Substance, um, I wanted it to be, let's say, more staged. Um, maybe we need to talk a bit about what the film is before I go into it. Yeah, or I mean, a clip or something. yeah, maybe we could watch a short yeah. clip. It's uh, A Magical Substance Flows Into Me is about, um, it's a film where we follow in the footsteps of uh, Dr. Robert Lachmann, who was a German Jew who emigrated to... Um, Palestine in the 1930s, and he was an uh, ethnomusicologist who was trying to establish some kind of uh, archive of, um, of uh, oriental, music. oriental music. Yeah, yeah. and so you follow in his, his footsteps and meets a lot of different people and different musicians and different traditions, mm -hmm. musical traditions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, the film is bas basically takes this radio program from 1936, 37 that was aired on the radio in Palestine as a starting point to make the film. So the film, in a way, or yeah, the film is a restaging of the radio program in many ways. So I just go back and I meet the communities that he would feature once a week. Uh, he would invite them to the radio station. They would perform their traditional music, and he would give a kind of lecture. But it was a very top-down, like the ethnographer giving the description of this community and the, the subjects performing their culture. So. Um, uh, yeah, maybe I can show a sh short clip and then we, c we can talk a little bit more about it. Uh, in this clip, I'm meeting uh, Kurdish Jews. Uh, so, yeah, I guess I have to say that the film basically follows two, ma two main communities within the many different sub-communities, but uh, it's Arab Jews, which means the Jews that immigrated from the Arab and Islamic world. Um, like a very common misconception is that Israelis are originally European. Half of them are, the other half came from the region, but also as far away as Afghanistan and um, North Africa uh, and the kind of neighboring countries. But um, Israel wanted to create, or the Zionist project wanted to create a, an identity that was a European uh, identity, which meant that for these Ar Jews to become Israeli, they had to f erase their Arab identity, or they had to kind of forget their, um, their language and their culture and become kind of European modern citizens. Um, so in the film, I'm interested in kind of what the Zionist project did to these communities, how it, uh, it culturally dispossessed them as it tries and c as it ha did and con continues to try to dispossess also the Palestinians of their culture and belonging in the land. So how there was kind of a double dispossession that happened, but that the, the Arab Jews, um, in a way, got a new home. They kind of, they were uprooted from the Arab world to be part of the Zionist project, but they became part of Israel. So they are at once colonized and colonizers today of, now they're colonizing the Palestinians. Mm. So Lachman studying Oriental music in Palestine was interested in all these different groups and what was unique about each of their traditions and what also connected them. And he was very much against dividing Arab Jews from the rest of the Arab world because he saw them as part and parcel, as they were indeed part and parcel of the Arab world until, uh, until the Zionist project basically came about. Mm. Um, so in the film, I follow these same communities, but 70 years later. And um, 
I mean, today it's, you, you know, you look at it, it's Palestinians and Israelis, but there's, again, lots of different groups there from the Palestinian communities. Also, the traditions between, like, the urban, the urban traditions of music are quite different from the rural, rural traditions and different from the Bedouin populations um, and other very small minorities. So, so that's, that's what the film, in a way, tries to look at, the relationships of all of these different communities and what, what has happened to their music over the course of these 70 years under the, under the project of Israel, in a way, or, or after um, the occupation of Palestine and this kind of the ongoing colonization. Um, so in this clip that, I, that we're going to show, there is a meeting with the, a, Kurdish, um, a Kurdish Israeli who uh, is working in a real estate office, an appraiser's office, sorry. Um, yeah, I'll show it and we can talk a bit after. Yeah. Okay. So it's actually very nice to see this again, and it now, um, before we were going to have this talk, I had a watch of earlier works of yours also, and it uh, strikes me how personal it all is, in a way. I mean, uh, your parents are a big part of this film. Mm -hmm. uh, you have a voiceover, mm -hmm. so you're speaking directly during this film. You also do that in Wild Relatives, yeah. and also in this new project that we're currently filming. It's about your parents are kind of the main characters. Yeah. And uh, um, even though um, earlier you were working uh, more on your own, uh, as a lot of video artists do, you mm -hmm. they film themselves, uh, they film, they film themselves, and they do all the editing and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. But also now that you've uh, taken this with you into a more kind of a professional or yeah. way of working with film, uh, um, I think it's nice to see this red string. Mm -hmm. And I think it's interesting just for the people here uh, to actually see some of your earlier works yeah. before you started to work with this kind of productions, more, uh, yeah, big yeah, bigger productions. And in particular, there is one um, film that I really am very fond of, which is called, let me see, because I always kind of forget the title. You have very beautiful titles on your films. Um, this one is called The Umpire Whispers. Mm -hmm. And it's a film where you that you shot yourself, mm -hmm. uh, and it's also a very personal film because you were going back to visiting someone from your past mm -hmm. because you were uh, a swimmer, a very ambitious swimmer in your youth, mm -hmm. and so you go back to see your coach and uh, talk about your relationship. Mm -hmm. Do you want to have any further introduction to this before we see some of it? Um, no. That's what no. Yeah. Okay. And when was this produced? The thing that we're going to see now. Um, I shot it in two thousand, like late two thousand and ten, I think. Mm. And um, I edited it in two thousand eleven. Okay. Do you want to say something about the title before we see it? Yeah. Yeah. The Umpire Whispers. I was reading a book that a lot of people here in Oslo actually were reading at the time, called Infinite Jest, by David Foster Wallace. Um, I just felt I was having a lot of conversations at the time about um, him and his writing. Um, An Infinite Jest is like the epic novel. It's like a thousand something pages. And um, it is the brave few who kind of ever finished it. Um, but there was one scene that I kind of reached and I really liked where uh, it's a dream sequence where the character, um, the, the book is also a lot about sports um, and where the, um, yeah, the protagonist who's also an athlete if I remember correctly, is um, in a football match. Um, and the stadium is packed with audience and all the players are on the field, but everybody is silent or whispering. And the game just takes place in utter silence. Um, and the umpire, which is kind of the referee, um, whistles, um, or yeah, whispers, sorry, uh, whispers. Um, and so just the description of the scene, it's like very surreal and a very intimate uh, description of a very public event. Um, and yeah, just that sentence, the umpire whispers, stuck with me uh, as a kind of a, a description of something that's both surreal, um, but also, again, uh, a kind of intimacy and closeness with a character who's a character of, um, um, who, who's a character of power of some kind, or who normally have a power relationship with, but 
yeah, but it's translated through a whisper, which is, um, yeah, it's a very intimate setting. Um, okay. Should we screen the beginning first and then the middle? Sure. Yeah. yeah. So it's going to be two clips just after each other. Yeah. Okay, so it's nice to see, I think. Uh, and also a very personal, very intimate project where yeah. you are going back to meet your swimming coach, Dima. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, to massage him. To massage and him and massage get massage. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I just think it's interesting to see it also because it is some kind of a uh, line between this and what you're doing and what you're working with now. Mm -hmm. It's personal but in different ways. Mm -hmm. And maybe it's also your development as an artist. Yeah. And how your perspective kind of changes a little bit. And I think it's partially about age i mean maybe it's too mm. simple to put it like that but um i feel like uh at least for me i don't know if this applies for everybody but um when i was when i was starting my impulse was to work on myself and the stories that i had grown up with and it was like you know um this age when i was also living in also like between 19 or <coughs> and 22 23 it's like it's a very transformative period and when you're kind of um, reflecting um, what kind of you've gone through in your upbringing, especially I had moved from Jerusalem to here. So uh, my impulse was always to kind of go back and look at things again. And um, um, I either either as a small revenge uh <laughs> <laughs> or, or in a way to come closer to things that I was too afraid of doing before or too afraid of confronting when I was younger. So in a way, the the kind of projects were like self therapy of some kind, or like mm. a way of dealing with things. Um, and it has gotten more difficult as I get older to to use art in that way. Maybe also because I've become more public, you know, and mm. I'm I'm already aware, like, oh shit, I'm going to be talking about this with thousands of people, you know. Mm. So I don't know if there's that filtration or if it's just an age thing and you know, growing interests of like the world around me and not just my own life mm. and. Um, but still, the f the, yeah, like you're saying, the, the starting points are remain very personal. Mm. Um, but I mean, also, uh, as we've been talking about, uh, the process of making the films have changed. So you're not holding the camera yourself anymore. Do you miss anything from that period of working, that immediate way of working, that you could just pick up a camera and you can yeah. meet the people that you want to meet and you can ask questions that come along? Yeah, 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 absolutely. You think uh, we'll work like that again? Yeah, I, I think so. I mean, I've I've tried now twice, and I call you like a few weeks later, you <laughs> know, like <laughs> with wild relatives. Also, I was like, okay, I'm gonna start shooting a bit myself, and and then I realized, no, this is actually a big, much bigger production, and what I want to achieve, like, with the image and with the yeah, with the whole kind of production of the film is on another scale that I can't really do myself, and mm. I know you do a much better job than me, and I kind of yeah, I get attached to like. Um, both a, a certain quality of, of image, but also like the pleasure of working with the team. So uh, there's there's really both. There's really both. Like I do miss the intimacy and immediacy of just holding the camera, and mm. the of course the relationships that you can establish when there's no one around, no one else around is very different than when you have a, sm a crew, even if it's a small crew. Mm. Um, but I also love being in dialogue, and it's like both with Wild Relatives and the new film we're working on, like it gives me a lot like working with you so you know it's not you're not just holding the camera of course like it's <laughs> yeah it's no, it's yeah. you're you're really building the film with me and um uh and now i start to get lonely you know when i don't have oh, you there yeah. you know like she gets more money <laughs> <laughs> um so but yeah it's something that i continue thinking about and even with the new film that we're working on together like I did shoot al on my own for a couple of weeks and maybe I will use some of that footage or some of the audio, um, especially because it was uh, with my family and aunts and so on. And of course, they're not them this themselves in the same way when there's a crew. But um, yeah, we'll see. But I'm, I'm just to return the question to you about like the, the personal, the kind of personal approaches to filmmaking because um, your last feature was was about motherhood and your relationship to your mother and your you as a mother to your children mm -hmm. and um i don't know was was it how was it for you kind of working on something so intimate was it something that you had been doing also before or 
was it the first time that you were working on something that personal? It was the first time I had been working on something personal in a documentary way. Mm -hmm. So I feel like all my work has been personal, but always fictionalized in a way. Mm -hmm. So it has this filter of, uh, it looks like it's invented. Uh, but uh, yeah, it was the first time and I really enjoy it mm -hmm. in another way than having to write stuff before I do it and then doing it. So I feel there's a, a, a quality that is in working with this kind of personal stuff that when it's uh, a success, it I think it's really good, you know, it's really yeah. worth <laughs> the yeah. effort uh, or and the risk of putting your personal story into the game. So I think we had some um, a little tip on wrapping up a little bit, but I, I, if there is any questions from the audience, we should take that first. And if not, I have a final, just a question. Is there anyone who wants to ask something to Jumana now? No pressure. No. Okay. So my question is, and this uh, because we haven't talked a lot about it. But uh, where do you get your inspiration from? What do you watch or listen to or mm. dance to or yeah? Yeah. What's your inspirations? Um, quite varied, I'd say. Um, I mean, with with sculpture, a lot of my inspiration is not from not only from art and sculpture, but really from. Um, like street life, like details in the street, like pavements, and um, particularly the way that things are put together in the Middle East that are kind of much more organic and DIY, and not not to romanticize that. It's because there is like, <coughs> you know, governments just don't do their job, and municipalities don't pick up the trash properly. You know, mm -hmm. so it's some kind of def dysfunctionality that creates um, um, different forms of solutions. So finding solutions for smaller problems, the way that you patch things up because there isn't like a more fundamental uh, way of like um, fixing things. So with sculpture, a lot of my inspiration comes from there and um, also from like archeological sites and archeological museums and museums in general. I really love visiting museums. Mm. And with films, um, it's also very much a mix. I mean, like even when I w worked on these past two documentary films, my references have be both been like very traditional documentaries. Uh, and I actually brought a clip which we can look at of a, like one of the documentaries that was my kind of guide when I was making Wild Relatives. Um, so kind of historical documentaries or social realist documentaries, um, but also fiction films, um, usually independent cinema of some kind, but um, the inspiration is really from from like the different genres. And in different films, there has been different references that have been kind of particular guides. So with Wild Relatives, there was a film called The Exiles from 1958 by Kent McKenzie, an American independent filmmaker that I've really loved for like the past 10 years and I've learned a lot from. Um, the film basically works with a group of uh, Native Americans that move from the reservation to Los Angeles um, and the struggles of them adapting to city life after living kind of on the country for, yeah, un uh, until they became adults. Um, and Kent McKenzie at the time worked mostly with non-actors and scripted their lives and then worked with them as fiction. Mm. Um, and I really loved the way that he worked and that really, like I had that film in mind when I was working on Wild Relatives and so this is why I worked a lot with these kind of non-actor who were acting and kind of developing what are you gonna say, you know, next. And we'd sit and sometimes script something together and recite it, you know, with Walid in s especially. Yeah. With some characters more than others, like mm. there was really work on the dialogue. Um, but then another film is uh, actually another historical from, from the 1970s by, um, let me see, I have it here, uh, by Omar Amir Alai, who's a great Syrian director that recently passed away and did a lot of films on Syria. And he was, he was very smart in, in the way that he used documentary and got permits to shoot under the Ba'ath regime, so under the Syrian dictatorship of um, Hafez al-Assad. Um, to do films that um, are very subtly critical of, of the regime and uh, of the oppressive mechanism, especially against the rural populations. Um, so this film was like the, this film and others that he worked on that had to do with kind of the hardships of everyday life uh, in Syria um, for peasant populations under this regime was another kind of big inspiration. 
but yeah, Eric for Romero, wild relatives for wild relatives that were going to screen yeah. afterwards. Yeah. Okay. Um, but like a magical substance, I was looking more at like Eric Romare because he has such a great sense of humor and a wonderful way of staging also the everyday. So um, yeah, now as I'm speaking, I guess a lot of them are filmmakers who deal with everyday life and like the details of ev like the cinematic details of everyday life um, from, you know, picking out the garbage to like small encounters, mm. um, architectural settings and so on. Um, so it's different. Yeah, there has been different filmmakers who have been like my... Um, my mentors somehow in different phases. Like Claire Denis was a big person for me like 10 years ago when I first started making film and, and Godard and so. Um, but I feel more recently like with each film there's a few films really that I have in mind as, um, as references and as keys that I, I really study the visual language to, to try to think about what they're doing and what I would like to do. So this, this is a, this kind of goes, the clip that we're gonna, um, that I have here, it's, it's like one minute. Um, it goes back to where we started with like talking about the camera and it being very much about rhythm and hands and soil and so on. Um, so yeah. let's see that as the, the end of this, since you're yeah. uh, probably going to stick around and see the film afterwards, so you know where the cool. inspiration came from. Cool. <laughs> 